Welcome to BergKnifeMaking.com. Today we're going to take a look at a nostalgia knife making project. Now, fellow diver Chris Friel and I used to uh, meet aboard a charter dive boat called the Wahoo in our younger days. We had a lot of great times. Uh, Chris recently contacted me um, and commissioned a build, a nostalgia build, to look back on his younger days crewing aboard not only the Wahoo, but also the Garlu, both uh, local New York, New Jersey area uh, charter dive boats. This particular project is a little bit of a stretch for me as far as the etching goes. So the first step in the build was to kind of finalize what kind of design I was going to use. So let's take a look. The Wahoo was originally a 55-foot custom a charter boat that ran out of Fire Island, New York. It was owned and operated uh, by Captain Steve Belinda. Steve Belinda, legendary in the local uh, shipwreck diving community uh, for his exploration, early exploration of the Andrea Doria in San Diego, Oregon. Uh, this is Chris Friel to the left and Captain Steve Belinda to the right. Aboard his boat, divers recovered, you know, a huge variety of artifacts from the different shipwrecks. Uh, Steve is on the left, I'm in the middle, and Hank Garvin is on the right. I threw in another picture of myself with a couple lobsters from my younger days. And when it came time for Steve to retire, he actually sold the boat to his, one of his second captains, Captain Hank Garvin, who's uh, on the right here. Captain Hank, uh, rest in peace, is a very, very good friend. Uh, he passed away a few years ago. He bought the vessel and renamed it Garlu. Now Chris Friel, who commissioned the build, actually continued to crew uh, aboard the boat uh, now named Garlu and run by Captain Hank Garvin. And, and here's another photo showing uh, Hank on the left and, and Chris Friel on the right with some huge lobsters. So this particular nostalgia build is very, very dear to my heart. Um, I'm very well associated with, with all members involved uh, and uh, was heavily involved in the local wreck diving community. I contacted my friend Aaron Hirsch who gave me his original sketch of the Wahoo that was used on Steve's original t-shirts back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, I had to kind of darken up the lines on that sketch to make it appropriate for the type of electro etching that I do on, the, on my blades. Um, and then I imported it into, I have a craft vinyl cutting machine called the Silhouette Cameo. I imported it into the Cameo software, and then th that software actually traces that sketch. All of the red lines are actual cut lines. That's what's going to get cut out of the vinyl. And what made this particular um, design kind of a little difficult for me was that there's going to be an overlay, not only of the, the, uh, the charter boat, but also the text for the name of the boat, and that's all going to be laid on top of um, another outline of Long Island, um, actually the, the Fire Island area of Long Island, which is where the Wahoo used to be based out of. So I did the same thing for, for all three components, Long Island for the name Wahoo and also for the boat itself. I had the Silhouette Cameo software trace those outlines. These are the cut lines. And then I sized and positioned them where I wanted them on the actual blade. And I, I did several versions of this. Um, I had to get rid of any overlapping lines. So, for, for example, this line went through the W, so it would cut the letter uh, into a smaller piece. So I had to individually grab that line, break the path, and modify it. And I had to do this for every section that, that crossed lines on the dive boat, as well as the island, as well as the, as the name. So, you know, the, the finished result came out real. I was really happy with the finished result, but it, it definitely take, took a little bit of time. For the letters, um, I'm using, especially for the shipwreck names, I'm using smaller text than I've ever etched before. Uh, so what I found is if I take a cut tool, and I cut through letters that have a small captive area, like the top of the R or the top of the A um, or the top of a B, and I do a cut line through, which connects that small 
area with the background, um, that very, very tiny piece of vinyl in the finished product has a much better chance of staying in place. So I also did this for all of the small text. Now for this particular video, I'm going to go through it pretty fast, but it still ends up being a fairly long video because I am going to show all of the different steps of the build. I want everybody to see exactly what goes in to one of these builds. So I start by scribing two parallel lines on the edge of the blade. Uh, those are called railroad track lines. Uh, then I move over uh, to my 2x72 grinder. This is an Origin Blade Maker 2x72, uh, powered by a two horsepower motor, variable speed. I'm just using a flat 90 degree table. And I, I happen to like to use uh, push sticks rather than my fingers. It, it, these blades really heat up very quickly and you can do a, a quite a bit more grinding using a stick than you can your fingers uh, before they, they start to get before they start to get smoking hot. The purpose here was to grind flat bevels, rough bevels, roughly to those scribed lines on each side. Now these are just the rough bevels, so I'm going to leave them a little bit um, rough, for lack of a better term, and a little bit oversized. And I will finish those up uh, after we do the heat treating. Now these grind lines are all horizontal. I am going to go to a finer pitch, so that first grind was done with a 60 grit uh, belt. Now I'm going to move to an 80 grit belt, and I'm going to change the position of that blank to vertical, and I'm just going to hold it with a handled uh, shop magnet, and I'm going to try to grind away all of those horizontal lines. The whole time, I'm also keeping an eye on the scribed um, railroad track lines on the edge of the blade. So the end result is you shouldn't have any horizontal grind lines, and you should have a blade that's fairly consistent width-wise along uh, the edge of the blade. Now, before we go to heat treating, there's a couple other steps that have to take place. Um, my blanks I have cut out on a, a, by a water jet company, Long Island Water Jet, uh, but I do like to ream the pinholes, and, and in that case, the quarter inch. And I also, I'm going to drill holes for the bolsters, and those I drill one eighth. And I also use a chamfering tool just to chamfer all of those holes. It just makes life easier later on when you can add the handles. You won't have a little burr sticking up. These are stainless steel blanks. Uh, they're AEBL, which is one of the super stainless steels. You know, they really hold a great edge. They're very rust uh, resistant or corrosion resistant. They're gonna get heat treated in a heat treating oven and I'm gonna wrap them first in stainless steel tool wrap. And I'm trying to create as airtight an envelope as possible. So I'll crease the seams and I'll double fold uh, each seam, you know, top, side, and side uh, before I place those in the heat treating oven. Uh, any oxygen or air that gets at the blade will cause a little bit of uh, slag or, or carbonization. Um, if you can reduce that, you just end up with a cleaner knife and, and less cleanup to do after the heat treating process. So this is the, the heat treating oven. Uh, AEBL I bring up to 1950 or 1960 degrees with a hold time of uh, 15 to 20 minutes. I like to do uh, batches so I'll make a few knives you know somewhere in the four to six range and then I'll heat treat them all at the same time. Uh, after they're done, after the hold time is finished I move them over and these get uh, plate cooled. So I, I sandwich them between two aluminum plates. Um, I actually have them that those plates mounted in a vise, a carpenter's vise. So I clamp those down and then I blow compressed air through the gap to cool them down as quickly as possible. The plates are really important, and as is the vise, uh, because it, it holds those blanks flat. So that the blanks have much less tendency to warp during the um, heat treating and cooling process. It only takes a few minutes to cool them off. 
You do have to be careful. Some of the, sometimes they, they are still hot enough to burn you. So I can cut these out of the stainless tool wrap now. And these are the knives after heat treating. You can see there's a little decarbonization on there. They're not bad at all. So the next step, it, um, right after heat treating, you let them get up to room temperature. And then they're going to actually go into a cooler with dry ice for a sub-zero quench. Uh, this is important um, for the blades to have a really good edge retention. After um, a soak in the sub-zero quench, they will also go into a regular kitchen oven uh, for 395 for two hours, uh, two cycles for a tempering cycle. Uh, because the knives are hard after heat treating, but they're also brittle. So the, the tempering cycle gets rid of some of that brittleness. Uh, then I go back to the 2x72 grinder. I'll start with an 80 grit, and I'm going to clean up all of that, um, that slag or that carbonization on the blades. After the 80 grit, I will go to 120 grit. And then depending on what I'm going to do on the blade, um, if it's going to be a, you know, a finished blade with very little etching, um, you know, I, I might go up to a, a 240 or 400 grit. Um, if I'm going to etch the entire blade, as I do with, with many of my scenes, uh, that would, this would be as far as I'd have to go, the 120. In, in this case, uh, even though it's going to be a very detailed etching, you know, two-tone etching on this knife, there is going to be a good portion of the knife that doesn't get etched. Um, so on this one, I think I went up to a, a, a 240, and then I used a buffing belt. The whole time I'm grinding, I'm also very, very uh, acutely watching those scribe lines that are still on the edge of the blank. Now I want to make sure that the, the bevel, the flat bevel, uh, is enough so that it's uniformly uh, you know, thin right to those scribe lines. So this is the vinyl that I've cut out. You can't see the design yet, um, but it's there. And I transfer it, and I put it exactly where I want on the blade. I had put some registration marks so that I could uh, line it up exactly where I wanted. And then I, use, I actually use 90 degree uh, tweezers, very fine tip tweezers to start weeding the vinyl. Now you can weed prior to, to placing the, the vinyl onto the blade, uh, but for, for some of these really detailed pieces, I find it easier to apply the vinyl uh, and then weed after it's on the blade. So here I'm, I'm weeding off, very carefully weeding off um, the actual sketch of the Wahoo. And you have to make sure that none of those little pieces lift up when they shouldn't. You know, basically everything that's gonna that, that's covered with vinyl um, is not going to get etched. So anything that's exposed is going to get etched dark. And the whole principle here is the island, Long Island, which is underneath here, is going to get etched after these dark lines. So all of the text and the dive boat sketch are going to be dark. Then Long Island underneath that will be a little bit of a lighter tone um, and then the water for the background is not going to be etched and that's all in theory you know basically keeping my fingers crossed i made a little um, silhouette of each of the prominent shipwrecks that the wahoo used to run uh, the uss san diego which is a world war one armored cruiser um, the passenger liner oregon which was a passenger liner sunk in 1886 uh, and the Angera Doria, which is a very, very famous shipwreck uh, that Steve used to run charters to. The etching process that I use is electro etching. So I use a car, you know, automotive battery charger, 12 volts, 2 amps. I connect the uh, positive lead to the knife. The negative lead goes to my etching plate, um, which, is, which I just welded up. It's basically a flat plate with a handle on it. Um, and I wrap gauze around that and I soak the gauze in electrolyte solution. Now I'm just using a combination of white uh, vinegar mixed with salt. You can see that I've got both blades elevated on, on a couple of small pieces of wood and that's so that they don't end up sitting in a puddle of electrolyte solution. 
uh, because what would happen is the bottom of the blank would then also get etched, and, and at this point I don't want that. So here I've etched the name and the, the, the sketch of the, of the Wahoo, and I've lifted away the vinyl for the, for the Long Island, for the Fire Island area. Now I'm going to do the lighter etch. Now I'm, I'm laying a piece of gauze on top of this so that each time I lift up and up and off uh, my etching plate, I'm not going to really move uh, that gauze. And that allows me to have kind of a deeper um, texture because that, that I'm using the, the texture of the gauze as the texture of the background that I'm trying to achieve. And you'll, if you ever experiment with this, you could try to etch with a, with a piece of cloth, a piece of paper towel, a piece of gauze. They'll all give you a slightly different texture. So the main etching, the dark um, name and sketch, I did for a total of four minutes in, in increments of about 20 or 30 seconds, allowing cooling time in between. You never really want the vinyl to get so hot that, um, that it would lose its adhesion. Uh, the lighter etching, which is for the, uh, the land mass, was done for maybe a minute. And when that's all done, you really keep your fingers crossed and you pull off or scrape off uh, all of the vinyl resist that's on the blade. Once all of that vinyl's off, then you can you know, give it a quick cleanup. I usually use a, uh, a 600 grit paper. Give it a quick polishing. You're going to polish you know, basically everything that's, um, that's high, which is the, the, the shiny areas. And for the first time, you get an idea as to what the finished product is going to look like. So for this knife, it has the Wahoo on one side, and on the other side, it has the same boat after it was renamed Garlou. Now I'm going to move on to bolsters. Now the bolsters are the, uh, the metal piece in between the handles and the blade. Um, I clamp a very roughly cut oversized piece of st uh, stainless steel into position. I use a hand drill and a clamp uh, to mark the location of the pinholes uh, that are through the blank. Then I put both pieces of bolster material into a, a drill press vise. That clamps the front and back edge parallel and I drill through those, um, basically in the position of those um, marked divots from hand drilling. And theoretically, that gives me uh, two pieces of bolster material that have holes through them that are perfectly aligned with the blank. In addition, I'll use a tapered reamer, and I'll ream from the outside on both uh, pieces of bolster material. So it, it gives me a tapered hole. The outside of the hole is going to be a little bit wider than the inside of the hole, kind of like a funnel, so that when I eventually hammer peen these pins, it will fill in that void and pull the two pieces nice and tight together. So these are the oversized bolsters in position. I just used an um, angle grinder with a cutoff wheel, actually, just to cut off the, the majority um, of that excess bolster material. You have to be really careful if you do it this way very, very easily damage the blade. And then I'll use a, a flap sanding wheel to kind of bring those into size. Now at this point, I don't want to bring them actually to the profile of the blank. I want to leave them slightly oversized. I'm going to um, finalize the profile of the bolsters and the handles after the handles are glued and pinned into position. So these bolsters are not yet pinned in place permanently pinned in place. I'm just going to mark what shape I want to the front of the bolster. And I'm going to then grind that shape. So I don't need the, the blank anymore. I'll just take the two halves of the bolsters, pin them together, put them back in the vise, and I can use, <clears throat> excuse me, angle grinder with a flat uh, sanding wheel in order to uh, bring that roughly to shape. Now because the front of the bol bolsters are not really going to be accessible once they are pinned in position onto the knife, you really want to finish those at this time. So I'll go through a variety of different uh, belts, different uh, grits. I usually polish these right down to 2000 grit, get them to a nice mirror finish. 
and then I'll throw a, um, a felt belt onto the 2x72 grinder with a little bit of uh, compound and that will uh, you know finish the polishing. Notice I'm, I'm not holding these bolsters by hand. I've got them both pinned together and then I'm also using them in a flat uh, vice grips. They would be very hard to hold just with your fingers. They get really hot. So the front edge has a mirror polish. Now because these knives, I wanted to make them kind of special. I'm gonna make these into dovetail bolsters. The first step in, in creating successful or really nice bolsters is to really make sure that the, the part that is going to be attached to the knife is absolutely flat. So I flatten it on a disc line. Now I'm gonna work on the dovetails. So I've marked with a magic marker the angle that I wanna create. Uh, this is an or Origin Blade Maker um, disc grinder. I've got the angle on the table set at approximately 45 degrees, and I'm just going to carefully and slowly just grind that back and forth until I've got the entire thing, uh, you know, ground to the angle that I want. These get hot very quick. Also, I've got a little uh, cup of water off to the side, so every every couple of passes, I'm cooling it off. And that's going to create the dovetail. You can see that these bolsters that I'm pinning into position, another trial fit, as the angles cut on the back, that the, the handle material will fit under or inside. Make sure that the flats, that each side is going to fit nice and flat on the blade. So now I'm going to hammer peen these into position. I use, um, I just use a hammer with a ball peen hammer. I find that um, a lot of small taps are better than, than you know, big powerful swings. And you just have to keep checking it. If it, if it lifts off at all, you can use the vise to clamp it back down. Uh, you, can, you, know, you can hammer in a variety of different ways, different positions. You don't want to do any damage to that back edge, the, the, uh, the dovetail edge. You just, you just have to be very careful. Now I'm going to work on the handle material. Now I picked this acrylic material, it's blue and white, uh, really because uh, Captain Steve Belinda used the blue and white on his original uh, dive boat crew jackets. So I wanted the old kind of go along with the nostalgia theme. I cut the dovetails, or I ground the dovetails on the same setup from the grinder. I had never adjusted that angle, and that's really important because then, then you're almost assured a perfect fit. I'm going to use two-part epoxy on both the blank and the handle material. I'm going to clamp these into position, pushing them tight up into the uh, bolster. And I'm going to double check uh, before and after they're clamped. It really sucks if you, if you glue it into position and you find out after the glue's dried uh, that you've got a gap. So, so you really want to make sure, hold it up to a light, you know, look at it you know, 10 times you know, before you walk away and let that glue dry. Now the way I do my hand, my handles, I drill the holes after the first side is dried. I'll use the uh, holes that are through the blank as my drill guides. And then I'll glue the second half of the scales into place. Basically just repeating the same function. You know, I'm, I'm gonna push them up into the dovetail bolster, clamp them into position, you know, make sure everything is fit perfect. Then I'll set that aside to dry. And then I'll use the pinholes that are through the one half of the scales as my drilling guide. And very carefully drill through all three pieces, both handles as well as the blank. And this really uh, is a nice way of getting you know, perfect pinholes. I use a one size oversize, so this is a size F for a quarter inch hole and that way the pins actually slide in pretty easily. I'll go back to the 2x72 grinder uh, with a coarse grit belt. I think that this was a, a 60. At times I'll use a 36, but you don't really want to go to a 36 too much uh, into the steel, um, you know, just because it takes so much to get rid of those grind lines. Um, 60 works out really well. You can, you can profile the handles 
to the size that you want as well as the profile of the bolsters you know pretty quickly make sure that you keep cooling because you don't want those bolsters and the blade to get red hot and, and melt the handle material. I'm then going to also use a coarse grit belt, no more than a 60, to uh, flatten out the handles and also flatten out the, the, uh, the bolster pins which were protruding from each side of the bolster and end up with a bolster that is completely flat to the handle material. Now, as I said before, there's a lot of steps that go into a project like this. You know, none of it is, is particularly hard. Um, some of it's a little time consuming, um, but if, as long as you go step by step, you know, it, it's absolutely a very doable project for most knife makers. Now, to grind the inside curve of the handle, I used to do this with a Dremel uh, grinder and a drum um, drum wheel. It, it's so much easier with a small wheel attachment. This is a, a small wheel attachment for my uh, OVM grinder. You can just slow down the RPMs on the grinder um, and you can go through a couple of um, grit belts and end up with a really nice finish very quickly. I actually use the flat platen of the 2x72 in order to start rounding over uh, the top edge of the bolster and the handle material. Um, you have to be very, very careful here. You don't want to touch the blade uh, to that grinder, especially that top uh, two-inch wheel at all. You very, very quickly could ruin a blade. Uh, but if, you, if you're careful and you just you know, keep an eye on that spacing, it's a very quick and very easy way of rounding over that, that top edge. So once the handles are all done and the bolsters are all done, uh, really all that's left is to sharpen the knife. Now I use the same 2x72 grinder to, to sharpen. Other people use a variety of other um, gadgets and you know, stones, etc. Um, I established the micro bevel with a 120 grit belt. You know, don't forget there's still a little thickness there. Um, I'll go from both sides and establish a, a burr. Um, and establish a burr along the entire length of the blade. Um, if there's one little spot that's missing, I'll just you know, keep grinding from the other side, flipping back and forth until I have it. Once I have a burr established, then I will go through a variety of different belts. Um, so I'll start at 120, I'll 240, 400, 800, uh, 1200, and 2000. Uh, really, I slow down the RPMs for each belt, and I really just polish the micro bevel after establishing that original burr. And for each belt, I flip the burr back and forth. Each time it gets a little bit um, less and less and less until you finally got, you know, barely any burr at all. And it's definitely, you know, it's just a, a learned skill, but it's not difficult. And it, other than changing the belts, that's probably the most time consuming part of the whole process. The final step is to throw a leather stroping belt on. In this case, I do not have the grinder on. I'm just using it to hold uh, the belt against the flat platen and a couple of upward strokes and I'm basically done. Sharpening a knife in this manner, I can get the knife razor sharp in, you know, within, in five minutes. as demonstrated by, by ever diminishing arm hair. So anyway, this knife is gonna be displayed uh, amongst Chris Friel's shipwreck artifacts. I'm sure he'll take it out on special occasions like Thanksgiving, et cetera, to carve, uh, you know, to carve his meal up. Uh, he can display it in, in either direction with the Wahoo on one side, uh, with the Garlu on the other. Um, I was very happy with the end result of the knives. Um, Chris actually had me make two knives. The second knife has the Wahoo on both sides, and he's going to present that to Captain Steve Belinda as a present, uh, which I just thought was absolutely fantastic. I hope you enjoyed uh, the video. If you did, I ask that you please uh, subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and, and leave a comment in the comment section. 
I'd like to give you uh, an invite to join us on our Facebook group, Knives and Knife Making, where you can post images of your own build. And I'd also like you to um, ask you to check out a book that Jason Northgott and I put out last year called Introduction to Knife Making. And that can be found on Amazon.com or on my website, BergKnifeMaking.com. Thank you very much.